Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sol Wooten. I work at the ACC Creative Writing Department um, as an hourly, and I also am a student at ACC. If anyone has an interest in creative writing classes, we have some awesome classes, so I would definitely recommend. Um, but tonight, it's my really great pleasure to um, introduce our fiction, our writer's <coughs> fiction prize winner, Shana. Um, and funny enough, uh, about five years ago when I was getting my undergraduate degree at Cornell College in Iowa, I signed up for my um, first creative writing class, I've never taken one before, and Shana was my professor. Um, and so it's really wonderful, that was one of the um, most memorable classes of my college experience. Um, and I still carry around some of the books that we, um, we studied in that class, um, Citizen and um, the Torres book, We the Animals. And um, so she really helped to introduce me to this world of creative writing. And um, I'm so, just so grateful for um, the way that she's encouraged me in my creative writing and also for her contributions to the world of creative writing um, with her works that are on display over there and that she's going to give us a little bit of a sample of tonight. Um, so for her biography, uh, Shana McAuliffe is an assistant professor of fiction at Union College in Schenectady, <laughs> New York. <laughs> Her stories and essays have appeared in Conjunctions, Alaska Quarterly Review, Review, Gulf Coast, Black Warrior Review, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA in fiction writing from Washington University in St. Louis and a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Utah. Her debut novel, The Good Echo, was published by Black Lawrence Press in December 2018. And her essay collection, Glass, Light, and Electricity, was published just this month um, by the University of Alaska Press. Um, so please join me in welcoming Shana. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, before I had a book, I didn't do a lot of readings. And um, I didn't know that one of the greatest pleasures of doing readings would be things like reconnecting with Soul, who I hadn't seen since Iowa, and then her name showed up on these emails. Um, and that's been like, one of the great treats. And also meeting new people. Thank you, Marguerite, for meeting with me. I'm, I'm so honored. And Adina for hosting. And thank you for starting Balcones Prize. I should clarify, I co-founded it. He was with John Herndon, who taught here for a long time. You're welcome. It's a very unique prize, um, and thank you to ACC um, and to Malvern Books. This is like, it seems like such a special bookstore. Um, so I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm going to read the very beginning, sort of abridged um, prologue to The Good Echo, and then I'll read a chapter from a little bit further in. <coughs> I'm not going to tell you a lot about it because I'm reading from the beginning. First, Cleveland. City of my birth, city of my death. City of brick and ice and buzzing streetcars. Sausages and perch, tornadoes and rain. City of the winding Cuyahoga. The long gray shore of Lake Erie. Steel bridges <coughs> pivoting. Factories purling steam into a white sky. I am, I was, Benjamin Donald Bell, child of Clifford and Francis Bell. I died of sepsis from an infected root canal. My father was my dentist. For now, I won't muddle through the logic of language arranged by a ghost. For now, simply this. Death has made a storyteller of me. Second, a lake named Mazanaw or Masanoga or Bon Echo, depending on who you ask. A few years before my birth, my parents built a lodge deep in the Ontario forest, looking north at the Narrows. Long before I was born in 1903, the Ojibwa and Algonquian had been corralled into reservations or dragged away to anywhere else. Their children were sent to schools near the cities, sent to be educated by Anglicans and Methodists, taught to believe in Jesus and English and arithmetic so they might forget their parents and grandparents, the ways of their people. But the lake remained a quiet place inhabited by fishermen and vacationers and pilgrims who went to listen to the echo that bounces from the rock, a tremendous wall of granite that rises 100 meters from the surface of the water, marked with drawings in ochre and iron, its holes and divots stuffed with sap and scratched with stories. People have always gone to the lake to listen. Lake Mazanaw, home to mosquitoes, black flies, gnats, frogs, fish, 
muskrat, rabbit, deer, turtles, black bears, and wolves. It is still a wild place, and wildness is what my parents loved about it, what I loved about it. In summer, boys still jump from the rock, something I wasn't allowed to do. When you're 13, my mother said, but I was never 13. Girls too jump from the rock, in rubberized sandals and jeans cut short and fraying, their hair tangled with sun and lake water. They jump, and on the way down, they bellow to keep their fear at bay. Their bodies hit the water like joyful fists, and they kick to the surface, gasping and alive. In winter, the water sleeps beneath thick ice. Cabins are boarded against the snow. Stars spin slowly through long nights. A thread of smoke rises from a single chimney, and at daybreak, a solitary old woman ventures out, her breath steaming forth in the bright sun of January. She stomps her heavy boots, and the sound returns to her from the rock across the lake. But we'll get to the lake soon enough. Death has made a storyteller of me, and it is my parents' story I will tell. If things had gone otherwise, if I had not died a boy, perhaps it would be my own story, with my parents providing my genes and lessons in how to tie shoes, little sticks, do algebra. Or perhaps, had I lived, I would find no occasion for storytelling at all. Does death make a storyteller of us all? Perhaps it makes musicians of some, carpenters of others. Perhaps nothing but sunlight and dust. I know only this story, these people, my mother and father, Clifford and Francis. And in life, they collected and invented stories. They told them to me, and they told them to each other. Perhaps they groomed me for this particular afterlife of listening and telling. And now I collect stories like a funnel, like a hole in a rock you put your mouth to and whisper. A hole in a rock you press your ear to. Listen. So where should I begin? A dark night, a hut on the banks of the Nile, or a canoe on a lake in Ontario, way back when Clifford and Francis were newlyweds, before me, before they had even imagined me. They paddled the boat together for the first time, gliding across the smooth surface of the water. They hardly knew each other then, and they hardly knew themselves. They had not yet had a son, they had not yet lost him. I know all the details. The tr trouble sometimes is choosing which to tell, which to stitch together. And beginnings? Beginnings are pliable tools for a storyteller. Let me build a threshold. Shall I use paste or string, thread or nails or staples? Of course, I will use words. <coughs> Clifford Bell and Francis Anthony were married on a Saturday in November, 1902, in a Methodist church of Brampton, Ontario. Francis's hometown. The church was brick and sturdy and silent. Yellow light slanted through the high windows, touching the thinning hair on Cliff's head and lighting Francis's veil. They were both Method Methodist, but Clifford believed it all a little more than Francis, who felt no lasting presence after her father died, who watched fish decay on the shore, growing putrid, swarming with flies. Eventually, only delicate pale bones licked clean and even those eventually disappeared, fish bones being so fine. But they called themselves Methodists when they got married. As their story lengthened, they met trickster gods and gods that traveled in lightning bolts, gods that loved cattle or beer, dung beetle <coughs> gods and goddesses that birthed the moon. Tangled with these other, their god came out changed. Cliff or Francis might have said that all these gods were different faces of the one god with whom they began. But that comes much later after they lose me, after they give up on everything they knew before, after Cleveland, after root canals, after the quiet brick house on Euclid Avenue, after grief and guilt and the grave beneath a pear tree, after they leave Ohio for Alaska and Switzerland and Egypt. So where do we begin? Close your eyes, point to a place on the map, a game of the young and in love. It doesn't matter where they go, where they end up, how they get there, what matters is that they are together, walking the trail, or speeding down some gravel road, dust rising behind the tires of a car, the picnic in the basket, the camera loaded with film. What matters are the stories that pass between them. <coughs> Go ahead, lay your finger down. Switzerland, then. Switzerland it is. June 1931, a wet day and rather dark. Here we find them, the dentist and his wife, Clifford and Francis Bell, my parents 
years after my death, on a train winding southwest through the belly of a mountain in the Alps. Soon enough, they'll board a bus to travel further into the hills to a higher village built at the receding edges of glaciers. I will channel their voices for you. I will stitch the squares. It is my mother that speaks first, my mother that speaks most. So much of the story is hers. Listen. No, we are not going to actually go to Switzerland. <coughs> So this is actually chronologically earlier in the novel, um, but still pretty close to the beginning. And this chapter is in the voice of Frances, the mother. Um, but there's sort of two voices. One is her thinking about the lectures that she gives as a school teacher, and the other is her telling the story. So you'll hear the pause and a shift in the voice, um, which is represented on the page, but you have to hear it in the pauses. The Horse Latitudes, Francis, Ontario, 1901-1903. to As a school teacher, I often bent to tie the shoes of the youngest children. I tousled their hair at recess, recess. I was restless, smoldering, quietly devouring roots, acorns, middens, mice. Chalk in hand, I learned to teach and scold, <coughs> but the children looked past me out the window, watching clouds or waving grasses. I learned to speak more loudly. Each day on my walk to school, I practiced my lectures in my head. Winds blow their way around the world in circular cells, colliding with each other and turning back, spiraling in on themselves. Crash and circle, crash and return, a parade of wind cells aligned like boxcars chugging across the surface of the earth. On the chalkboard, I drew the winds of boxcars along the lines of latitudes, over and over, the same diagrams, the same lectures. Divide the earth into bands, circumscribe her latitude with invisible lines, number these lines, name them with their angle from the center of the earth. In the schoolyard, the children shrieked and stumbled. They were not my children. I had no children. I wondered, does giving birth turn a girl into a woman? Until then, until I had a child of my own, would I remain a girl? After lunch, all in a line, the students chanted their multiplication tables, their voices like a train accelerating downhill, but they did not understand what it means to multiply. Between the lines named 30 and 35 degrees, both north and south of the equator, there's a gap between the wind cells. Here, above the flat yellow-brown of the Sahara, or the green-blue, gray-black of the ocean, winds <coughs> whirl away from each other. These are glossy bands where ships lose, lose speed, stall, and drift. Their sails luff and flap while the crew lounges topside. Lips crack. I pretended I did not have favorites, but I loved the dreamers, the ones who made strange drawings of people with heads shaped like lumpy hearts, the ones who called purple amethyst or lavender and forgot to comb their hair. I thought a child that watched birds was far more interesting than one that could breathlessly recite her multiplication tables. They came to school with mud on their faces, or they smelled like dandelions and bore yellow streaks on their arms. They carried weeds like bridal bouquets, like royalty, and the flowers drooped and browned on their desks, but still they refused to, to throw them out. If you sailed from the North Pole to the South, you'd go through three such dead zones, the calms of Cancer, the doldrums, the calms of Capricorn. The calms are also dubbed the subtropical highs, referring to atmospheric pressure and the horse latitudes. Each night, the chamomile, cross stitch, and a branch against the window, scritch, scritch. In winter, I let the fire burn, and the room glowed like quiet hell. Saturdays, I walked four blocks to the store for the same groceries every week. In summer, maybe a little basket of berries. Trade ships bogged in the subtropical zone, quickly ran low on food. If only the ship were lighter, the captain may have reasoned. If the ship were not so heavy, this stale breath, this sorry excuse for wind, might be enough to push the boat along, to fill one sail to billowing, to stretch it taut. I met Clifford at a picnic. I was standing in the churchyard, spitting watermelon seeds into a wadded napkin. I noticed his smooth skin, and then the way he looked steadily at me when he spoke. He wasn't afraid of people like so many others. 
I looked away. Flying birds, running children, a storm cloud moving in from the north. His eyes were the palest shade of blue. Not like water, but maybe like ice. Like thin, cool glass. His spectacles were round with silver frames. They were not scratched nor smeared with fingerprints. He was an immaculate man. He pulled a square of chamois from the breast pocket of his vest and polished the spotless lenses. He was wearing a bow tie. Horses are heavy. They eat and drink so much. So the sailors pushed them overboard. Pleasure to meet you, Francis, he said. He didn't look like a dreamer, but there was something about him. He glanced at the wadded napkin in my hand, the watermelon rind gnawed to the white. He took a slice of watermelon from the table beside us and bit into it, the juice running down his hand so he had to lean forward to avoid dripping on his shirt. No, not a dreamer, a practical man, but at least he wasn't afraid to get a little messy. You've been there so long. You've screamed and screamed. Your screams do not suffice to propel you into the choppy water, but your voice is raw. Who hasn't been there, waiting for the next wind, hungry and bored? The job was supposed to be temporary. The brain was supposed to be resting. The illness was supposed to go away. You were supposed to grow up. You were supposed to find an answer. Why do people look at you that way, now squinting, now soft-eyed, compassionately, sympathetically, or impatiently, raising an eyebrow, waiting for you to bring them tea, coffee, a slice of pie, or maybe they do not look at you at all. We walked across the grass together, stopping to watch a game of horseshoes. One of his brothers was playing, so our conversation was punctuated with outbursts. Attaboy, Andrew, that's a ringer. But then he turned back to me, gave a little nod, and resume our conversation. He was a dentist. A good, solid set of teeth, he said, resembled a well-tuned Steinway, felt hammers striking in chorus, ivory keys aligned. The superb dental arch was like a stone bridge, each stone in its place mortared by pale pink gum. A tongue should rest like a lily pad on a pond. He demonstrated this by patting the back of one hand with the palm of the other. The owner of such a mouth breathes through her nose without effort. Her nostrils are wide open corridors from the world to her lungs. And a poet, too, I said. I did not point out that his metaphors were mixed or that it all seemed rather hyperbolic. I thought he was lucky, that such people are lucky, those who find something they love so deeply, something to which they commit their lives, from which they never look away. I did not love teaching, and so I envied that commitment in others. I envied passion. Dust bunnies congregating in the corner, <coughs> dead flies in the light fixture, the tiniest gust might get you going, might push you out of it. Clifford was the ninth boy in his family. A week later, he brought me home for supper to meet his parents, and I paused in the half-lit hallway to study a photograph hanging on the wall. Mr. and Mrs. Bell stood at one end, hands flat at their sides, shoulders squared to the camera. Their ten, cent, ten sons were arranged from tallest to shortest beside them, ten perfect sets of teeth. Clifford's smile was slow and easy, but his lips were not generous. His top lip fell like a curtain over his teeth, flat and fleshless. When finally he kissed me, after we'd been courting for two weeks, I felt his teeth press hard against my own. He did not tell me then that he wore dentures, that he had lost his perfect teeth to typhoid fever at the age of 22. But even on a windless day, the ship is moving, however slowly. Scattered ashes drift and flutter, but they find their weight. They sink and disappear beneath the glassy surface, and the boat moves. It was eight months later on our wedding night that I went into the washroom, and there they were, a pair of dentures with glass at the edge of the sink. I was startled. Dentures, when they're not in their, own, their owner, owner's mouth, are awful things. Too pink, too slick and shiny, too jeering. Shaking a little, I accused him of lying to me, but he said he hadn't thought it important. It wasn't a secret, he said. He pointed out that I had not seen him without his clothes before, either, but I didn't seem to think it a lie when I discovered that he had a line of hair running downward from his belly button. Incomplete knowledge, he said. Dentures are like underclothes, like hidden scars. In any way, 
he said. We're genetically excellent. It was a fever that had ruined them, an outside force. Our children would have the teeth of, a rhino of rhinoceroses. All of this he said without his dentures in his mouth, while I held the glass with the dentures nearing within. Without his teeth, he looked ancient. His lips puckered in on themselves as if, as if his mouth would swallow his face. He took the glass from me and fished out the teeth. He slipped them into place, and he was again himself. Waiting for a favorable wind, a stir, a squall, a thunderstorm, the sailors leaping to the sheets and winches, the boy in the crow's nest climbing down fast, dropping to the deck on his bare feet, the swimming, swinging hammocks, the heavy keel, the ship heaves, and is free. How incomplete our knowledge was. We did not yet know that we would have only one child and that his teeth would be his demise. But had we known how things would go, had we seen our hidden future, would we have done things differently? Would I have stayed a school teacher alone and restless, tying the shoes of other people's children, drawing lines of latitude on the chalkboard while Clifford, in Cleveland, drilled into his patient's teeth, drained the folk and filled the roots with silver and molybdenum, a single man doing imperfect work, making his quiet soup for dinner each night, each of us living a safe and lonely life. It is impossible to know what we begin and where, impossible to recognize the middle or the slow movement of the boat. Incomplete knowledge, he said, like underclothes and hidden scars, the scars we hadn't earned yet, the wounds that would never heal. But how we drifted once, for days, for years, on a bright and glassy sea. Thank you.